everybody, it's me again and today I'm going to be tackling a chemistry topic which is to do with crude oil. Now I'm not going to go into alkanes and alkenes and talk about obviously how you name them like methane, ethane, propane etc because I've actually talked about that in a separate video so just look down my playlist and you'll be able to find my video on alkanes there. Today's video is going to be about crude oil, it's going to be about key definitions like hydrocarbons and we're going to be talking about how we can separate the various parts of crude oil into fractions using fractional distillation. Don't worry if you're like, what is she talking about? Doesn't matter, I promise I'm going to try and explain it all super clearly so that you can get to grips with this topic. Let's start with first of all what crude oil is. Now crude oil is a very black, sticky, unpleasant substance um, and it's very valuable to us and it's worth huge amounts of money, it makes people billionaires, but the crucial thing is it actually starts life as being very black and sticky. Now remember it's made from the bodies of dead sea creatures and dead animals that died millions of years ago. What happened is there were high temperatures and pressure and they got squished together and that's a really basic overview as to how crude oil came about. But luckily most examples don't require you to know too much about how it's made, more you need to know about what they then do with it. So first of all crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons. You need to define that very carefully. A hydrocarbon is a substance which contains hydrogen and carbon atoms only. You must say only in order to make sure you get the full number of marks for the question. So we've got this huge soupy mass of loads of different hydrocarbons and the point is they're all different lengths. And we know that the first alkane is methane, again look at my video if you don't know why I'm saying that, but there are some humongous hydrocarbons which don't have one carbon atom, they've got 20 carbon atoms for example. So the point is, we've got a soupy mass and we need to separate it. So what we use for that is fractional distillation. And that's just a special name for a industrial process whereby we heat the crude oil. Um, as you heat something, eventually it will be hot enough so that it will evaporate. The mixture evaporates and it cools and condenses. However, because the various compounds inside crude oil are different lengths, it means that they have different boiling points. Obviously the longest length carbon chains will have the highest boiling point and the shortest length will have the lowest. So what you find is that these fractions rise and we call the various different components within crude oil fractions. They rise, they cool and they condense and they all condense at different temperatures. So the ones with the shortest carbon chain, they'll condense at the top of the fractionating tower and that's where it's coolest. The ones with the longest carbon chain will condense at the bottom of the fractionating tower and that's where it's hottest. And that kind of makes sense because if you've got a long molecule, it requires a lot of energy and a lot of heat energy in order to cause it to evaporate. So even when you reach high temperatures, it still won't have evaporated. It's only when you reach those really high temperatures that it'll evaporate. Now you need to know the order that the fractions appear in the fractionating tower and different examples will say different things. But I'm going to run with this version and what you find, the first fraction that comes out is refinery gases, then you have gasoline, then you have kerosene, you have diesel oil, fuel oil and bitumen. See, even I struggle to remember these. But you need to know a few uses for each fraction. So refinery gases, that's what we use in our central heating and gas for our stoves. So that's really important. Then you have gasoline and the crucial thing is that is used for petrol in cars. Kerosene is used as fuel for aeroplanes. Diesel is used in some cars, lorries and some trains. Fuel oil is used in ships. And finally, bitumen is a very black, sticky substance and we use that on road surfacing. So that's just a summary of the different uses of the different fractions. Just to talk quickly about the properties, remember therefore that the short chain molecules will have lower boiling points compared with longer chain ones. They will flow more easily, which means they're less viscous. They will be more volatile, which means they'll evaporate more readily. So make sure you've got all those properties listed. And remember, obviously, the opposite argument works for the longer chain molecules. So longer chain molecules will have higher melting and boiling points. They will flow less easily, so they'll be more viscous, and they'll be less volatile. They'll be less likely to evaporate. Okay, so we've talked about all of those things. Now we're going to quickly talk about what happens when you don't have enough of the useful fractions, because obviously it kind of makes sense that the ones which appear at the top of the fractionating tower, the lightest ones, the most volatile ones, they're the most useful to us and we don't actually find the ones that appear at the bottom of the fractionating tower as helpful. So we need to use a process called cracking which is the way in which we break down really large chains into smaller chain molecules and these are the small, smaller, more useful fractions. You just need to know a few conditions for that. First of all it happens at 700 degrees. Second of all you need a catalyst. Remember a catalyst speeds up the rate of reaction without being used up. 
and the catalyst used in this reaction is a mixture of silicon dioxide and aluminium oxide and that lowers the operating temperature. And so in those conditions what you'll find is the larger mo chain molecules will get broken down into smaller, more useful ones and that's the real purpose of cracking. Remember that we actually use fuels to burn in order to generate energy to run our cars etc. So you need to know the difference between complete combustion and incomplete combustion. Complete combustion just means that you have a hydrocarbon which then has plentiful supplies of oxygen which leads to complete combustion and you end up with carbon dioxide being produced as the byproduct. And carbon dioxide, it has issues in terms of global warming, but in terms of our health it's actually an okay gas to be in our atmosphere. Um, opposite to that is if you have non-plentiful oxygen, so oxygen is scarce and what happens instead is incomplete combustion occurs and unfortunately that results in the production of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a very poisonous gas and it, it's um, well known in the news that it can sometimes call carb cause carbon monoxide poisoning and the problem with it is it combines irreversibly with the haemoglobin in your red blood cells and what that means is that oxygen can't be carried by your red blood cells so less oxygen goes around your body and actually it poisons you so that's a very nasty gas indeed. I'm just going to point out a couple of key words, things like a homologous series. If they ask you about the homologous series, what they're doing is they're asking you about the various properties of families of compounds. So you'll find that the alkanes are a homologous series and the alkenes are a homologous series. And they're a family of compounds, but all that you can see different is that they change in terms of the number of carbon atoms. So, for example, methane, ethane, propane, butane, or ethene, propene, butene, pentene. So that's the kind of difference, but the crucial thing about them is that members of the same homologous series, and this is what they'll ask you in the exam, show the same chemical properties, but they show a trend in physical properties. So that's what you say in the exam, and what that means is their melting and boiling points, because those are physical properties, they'll just slow, show a slight difference depending on whether you're looking at a large carbon chain or a small carbon chain. Right, I really hope you found that helpful. I'm going to do another video on structural isomers because I need to use my iPad for that. Remember to give it a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it and any questions and comments below and I'll see you next time. Bye!